Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ian. I'm aware that I'm the last speaker of this evening. Uh, and so uh, I will try to give you a lot of information uh, and then we can move on to whatever food or beers or whatever else uh, you have planned. Uh, so I'm going to be talking here uh, on making pandas fly. Uh, so who am I? Uh, I'm an interim chief data scientist. This means I run my own company and I go and work with a variety of companies uh, on their different data science uh, problems, uh, either helping teams or solving intellectual property problems. So writing code, doing data science, building machine learning models, that kind of thing. I've been doing this for nearly two decades now. It's nearly 20 years. I've done lots of things in lots of different organizations. Um, I'm also co-author for High Performance Python, uh, which I'm super excited about. One of the reasons I'm excited is normally when I've, uh, when I've got the book, I'll be at a conference. I get to sign it at the, uh, the conference. I get to talk to people about it, and that's brilliant. Having written this and got it published just a month ago, we're all in lockdown, so I can't physically give anyone a copy. So you are the, the first audience, I think, that I'm showing a physical copy to. So this is a book um, all about making Python code, mainly numeric code, go faster. Great for data science work, of course. And my co-author is uh, Misha Gorelick. Um, I'm also one of the co-founders of PyData, uh, PyData, sorry, PyData London, uh, the, uh, the London branch. Uh, I'm super proud of the community we built there with over 11,000 members. Um, and uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you either at uh, international PyData events or events back in London uh, when we're past lockdown. I also teach courses on things like high performance because it turns out I'm a little bit, uh, I get a little, I care about this. I really get enthusiastic about it. And I'll mention some more of the courses uh, later on. Uh, before we proceed with the talk, uh, I wish to remind you all uh, that all the volunteers in the Pi Data world are volunteers. Uh, so I would invite you all uh, as attendees who are enjoying a very fine conference uh, to remember that your volunteers, your organizers, and your speakers uh, are all here volunteering their time. So go into uh, Discuss, go into the lobby channel uh, and say thank you. Uh, it's a nice thing to do. Um, and uh, the, the money raised behind the conference goes to NumFocus. That's the nonprofit that benefits all of us in our Python data science uh, and wider Python ecosystem. Uh, so it's a great uh, charity behind all of this. Go and say thank you. So uh, what are we doing today? We're going to talk about uh, pandas, mainly focusing on pandas. I've given variants of this talk looking at different parts of the wider pandas data science ecosystem. Today's talk is focused on pandas. We're going to save RAM. We're going to see how that can impact some of our speed. Uh, and we're going to look at some other ways of calculating faster, including going behind the scenes of NumPy. And then I'm going to reflect uh, at the end on uh, some advice, uh, some of which uh, is in the book, and uh, there's more that I've been thinking about, on being generally more performant in our data science roles. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, a demo. So let's go to my, oops, let's go to the right notebook. Here we go. So this is my making pandas. So I'm loading in uh, some data. I'm loading in um, the UK Companies House basic company data uh, data set. So this is a live data set updated every month. Um, we get about four and a half million records coming through in a CSV file, reasonably well. Um, but there's a chunk of data in here. Um, four and a half million rows, and it's all of the extants, all of the existing live companies uh, that exist uh, in the UK. Um, and you can see here some of the fields that uh, we're going to be looking at, company name, uh, an accounts uh, day, um, category, uh, and incorporation date. So a variety of uh, different data types, the D types that we see uh, in pandas, D type being a data type, and often inherited, uh, most of these are inherited from NumPy, NumPy being the numeric Python library that sits behind um, uh, many of the pandas uh, columns. So we load in this data set, we do a little bit of uh, formatting, uh, telling it how to deal with some of the date time parsing. Uh, and then I ask it uh, for DF info. So data frame, give me your information. Uh, and it tells me what my D types are, what my columns are. Uh, and then down here, it tells me the memory usage. 
And that's a lie. That number's wrong for a start. Uh, it's wrong for a good reason. It says 203 megabytes or 203 plus megabytes. Uh, so it's telling us that it's at least 200 bytes, but probably more. Uh, and it turns out that by default, uh, the info command doesn't check the string objects. Uh, so that's all the, uh, the objects that we can see there, the company name, the registered address, uh, and the company category. It doesn't introspect each of those because each of those strings has a different size associated with them. It's a bit memory intensive to calculate. We'll look at what the, uh, the true size is a bit further on. Uh, so here's a first little tip for you when you're doing info. Uh, you can actually ask it to calculate the memory usage. You can say memory usage equals deep, uh, and then it will go and calculate the memory usage of all of, uh, all of the items in all of the columns, including strings. Uh, and we'll find out here that it's, uh, it's much larger. It's, uh, it's a good gigabyte. Uh, I think it's a gigabyte or so. So what can we start to do with this data? Well. One thing I'm interested in is what kind of companies do we have uh, in our data set? Uh, in a, the wider context, I've been using this data set to look at the effect of the pandemic uh, on uh, company registrations and dissolutions, that's closures of companies in the UK. And if we have time, I've got a bonus slide which uh, I might show on that. So here we can do uh, a value counts in Pandas. So I take the company category and I ask for a value counts and I ask it to give me the top 10. There's about 30 or so uh, different company types. Uh, many of them have very small counts. There's a bunch of just really interesting nuances around some of those companies, but they occur very infrequently. The most common company type here is a private limited company. That's 4.2 million occurrences. Uh, so it's a limited company. It's uh, the same kind of limited entity we see uh, in lots of countries. Here I'm going to ask uh, for the company category's memory usage with that deep equals true uh, flag turned on here. Um, you can, uh, there's a couple of different options here uh, that we can use. Deep equals true, that's the slow, complicated one. Um, I actually ran it seconds before I came onto this call, slightly heart in mouth because I was uh, running a, a bit of code live, uh, which was very silly, of course, um, because I've changed the format of this. I wanted to print out the bytes that we see here. And you can see that uh, this string column, four and a half million rows, costs about 820 megabytes. So that's a huge amount of storage. Uh, it's nearly a gigabyte just for this one column, separate to all of the other columns. That's a lot of RAM that gets sunk into this. So how could we save some RAM here? Well, this is a, uh, this is, so, well, I guess one question would be, why do we want to save RAM? If we save RAM, we have more RAM, for other data, so either more columns of data or for more rows of data. Uh, one of the problems with pandas is that uh, in its basic state, it can eat a lot of RAM for some column types like strings, but also just for floats and integers that we'll see shortly. And so you end up limited by the amount that you can put into RAM. And Pandas doesn't have a memory mapping back to disk option. Everything has to be in RAM. So if we can compress our RAM, so if our data types eat less RAM, we can get more rows into RAM or more columns, depending on what we're looking at. And this means we can do more just with our basic Pandas without having to learn a new system like Dask or Modin or Vakes or one of the other alternatives. So how do we compress? Well, uh, one of the obvious ways of compressing um, any data that is frequently repeated uh, in uh, the last year or so is to use the new category data type. So we can say uh, DF company category, that's our column, as type category. And then we get the category version back. It's a very quick operation. And then I do uh, value counts on my company category underscore cat. This is my variant column that I've set up. And I look at those counts and I've got the same counts. I get exactly the same data back. Memory usage deep equals true, 460 megabytes rather than 820. It's nearly half the size for almost no work at all. So that's brilliant. That's really nice. Um, now it turns out, as long as we're not manipulating these strings, if we're just using them as some kind of indicator, uh, then uh, a lot of our operations uh, will have twice as much memory available to them. So that's brilliant. Is it the case that it might go faster? Well, there's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, so let's look about behind the scenes. Uh, how is our category set up? Well, we've got the categories uh, back there. Uh, each turns out we have lots of instances of very few strings. So this is brilliant for this compression uh, inside categories. Uh, and it's set up using this uh, categories list and codes, and then the numeric codes are the thing that's actually stored that we operate across. If we start timing some operations, so I'm using percent time it here on the data frame, on company category to do a value counts, 
that operation costs 400 milliseconds. The same operation applied to company category underscore cat, that's the as type category variant, takes 23 milliseconds. So it's a huge saving. That's, uh, what's that? That's 10, that's 20 times faster. So that's amazing. Now, your mileage will vary depending on the kind of data sets that you're using. If you can't compress that much, if you've got lots of strings, then of course you won't get um, that much memory saving. You should still get some memory saving if you've got any kind of repetition in your data. It only doesn't work when you don't have any repetition in your data. Uh, and it works really well for strings, and it can work for numbers as well, as say if you're using integers as some kind of ordinal indicator. So you have a large number of a few different unique numbers, um, then uh, it might be the case that the categories give you some, uh, some improvements there as well. And of course, uh, the operations run a lot faster. Now, what else can we do with this? Well, uh, if I take uh, my data frame and I set index to company category, that's the original string column, uh, and I make one new data frame, a DF2, no cat. And I take a second uh, data frame, DF2 cat, where I've set the index to be the category variant. And then I time some lookups using a mask on the index. Then it turns out we have another huge saving, 288 milliseconds compared to uh, 400 microseconds. So it's orders of magnitude faster. That's, that's an amazing speed up. So if you're doing certain kinds of lookups on your data and you've got lots of strings, and you haven't come across categories before, uh, I certainly recommend uh, that you try to uh, try to use the categories here. Uh, this came up in uh, my high performance, uh, my higher performance Python class that I ran recently. Uh, and one of the attendees uh, on the course was really looking for ways to speed up uh, some of their indexing. Uh, and we discussed the category option. I didn't know how well it would work out on their data set. It turns out that solved the one bottleneck that they came on the course to try to get around uh, and solved a whole pile of issues. Uh, so it was a really nice uh, discovery, and it really got me thinking more about how I can use categories uh, in my own code. So let's try a, a different column uh, and uh, think about our data in a slightly different way. Uh, so uh, let's make a, a numeric column. So here I want to know uh, how old my companies are, and then I want to do a couple of calculations off of that. I don't have that column. I have got, I've got a date time. So I'm just going to make a, a delta column. Uh, so I'm going to take uh, the date time now, and then the incorporation date uh, of each of my companies, create a delta, Go into the DT accessor, that's up here. Uh, if you're new to pandas, if you've got a date time column, you can do .dt to get some date time operations like the number of days that are represented behind that date. Divide it by 360 and I get an approximate number of years for the age of the company. Uh, do a little sanity check here just to make sure that I've got no negatives coming through. Uh, it turns out uh, the way the data is laid out, if I use the default pandas date time processor, my months and days get inverted back to front. And once they're inverted, then um, I might have, uh, uh, sometimes I get day, day, uh, month, month, sometimes I get month, month, day, day. And so my dates get flipped back to front. And it turns out some of my badly interpreted dates are in the future. And then I get negative ages in this calculation. That, of course, is bad news. Uh, so. I need to go and fix that, and I put in this assert check, and I'm going to reflect upon this kind of checking inside notebooks just to validate some basic assumptions and do some data quality checks uh, a bit later on in the talk. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to graph this just so that we can see it here. We can look at the distribution of ages in years of each of the companies. Uh, it's not a terribly informative chart. It tells us that the vast majority of our companies are very young. And then there are some companies that are 20 years old. There are a few more companies that are 40 years old. And uh, the company ages go up to over 100 years, actually. So we do have a few very old companies in the UK. I don't really care about that This uh, for the, the purposes of this talk. I just needed a, a new numeric column. Uh, so let's uh, do a quick describe on that column. Uh, I've got 4.4 million uh, rows of age years. Uh, I've got a mean age. Well, with that kind of skewed distribution, I don't really care about a mean. That makes no sense. Um, but I've got my minimum, my maximum, my interquartile range. And I can see those numbers there uh, to many decimal places. Way more precision than I actually need. I've got a 64-bit uh, floating point number, a float 64 behind this column. That's the default in pandas. So that takes eight bytes. So that's, uh, that's eight bytes. That's a lot of bytes uh, times four million rows. Um, that's a lot of precision when I just want an approximate age. Could I do any better? Could I save some RAM? Well, of course I can. Um, I can uh, call as type 
uh, and ask for a float 32, so uh, using four bytes rather than eight bytes. And I'm going to call this age is my numbers are the same. So it turns out with eight bytes or with four bytes, I get the same result. Well, that's kind of brilliant because this means that I could just cut my RAM usage in half uh, and then I could fit more, more data into RAM. And possibly, just possibly, because my data types are smaller, possibly when I do operations, the data flows faster. So maybe I can get some speed ups and we'll see that in a little while. Uh, the more important thing to me is that I can just compress my RAM usage. I'm not doing any actual compression. I'm simply using fewer bits to store the same information. There will be some imprecision that's introduced as a result with these long floating point numbers. Here they're rounded on screen, but to 20, 30 decimal places, there will be some imprecision in that uh, conversion down where I lose half the bytes. But for my approximate age, I don't care. Many times in the world, we end up with int 64s and float 64s uh, counting very small or a small range of numbers. So a small number of very interesting numbers uh, and ignoring the rest of the bits that could be representing very large or very tiny numbers. Uh, and then we forget about that and we use more RAM than we need to. Uh, so we can do some uh, conversions uh, and then things will go, uh, then we'll get uh, more data into RAM. So let's, uh, let's just do another double check here and see what happens if we use the float 64, the float 32 and the float 16. Uh, so, if I iterate through float 64, then the float 32 version, and I look at the range of my company ages, I can see 0 0.0472 uh, up to 190. Same precision for float 64 and float 32, at least to several decimal places, which is way more than I need for this particular problem. But the RAM usage is halved, 35 meg down to 70 megabyte. So that's brilliant. It's a, it's a really nice save. This is a good thing. Um, but if I use a float 16, I do half my RAM usage again, but now I see that the imprecision is beginning to creep in, um, and this is not looking quite so good. Um, but you know, for my approximate needs, this is actually fine. Um, but depending on your needs, this might be this might give you too few um, bits of precision, so maybe you get some rounding. Uh, there's an important note in here, and we'll see this on a chart later. Float 16 is hardware simulated, so it's slower than Float 32 and Float 64. So. Let's just have a quick recap. If I use my original data set, company category as strings and AG is as float 64s, that's about uh, 800 megabytes using info memory usage deep. And if I do the same thing with the uh, category version and the 32-bit uh, version of uh, my age, uh, then I'm down to 450 megabytes, nearly a 50% savings. So that's pretty significant for very little work. Now, wouldn't it be nice if there was a tool that could tell us how we could compress our RAM? Well, I was thinking this just recently. Uh, I didn't mean to put it in the book. Uh, I didn't get around to writing it, so I wrote it uh, a month or so ago. Um, it's a super simple tool. It iterates through the columns in your data frame. Here, I'm taking a sample of uh, 1 million rows on a subset of the columns just to keep this easy. And then I ask my D-type diet tool to report on data frame. And it tells me, for example, the company name column, which is an object where every company name is unique, it has no suggestions for that. It turns out it doesn't know how to compress something that's unique. However, the company category, which is frequently repeated, it says it takes 89 megabytes in this particular sample. And we could save 80 megabytes by doing company category as type category. That's a really nice saving, just as a simple suggestion. And we get the same thing here for the float, so the float 64 and the float 16 for an account ref day. Um, although I noted that there might be a speed hit around that. Uh, it's worth noting, uh, if you look at the readme on this project, there's a bunch more advice in there. I've got a couple of other people trying it and beginning to bring ideas to this. You'll only find it on my GitHub. It's not been released anywhere yet. Uh, if this is interesting to you, go and have a look on my GitHub uh, and give me some feedback. I'd love to hear what you think. Uh, I'm just going to zip through this bit. Uh, there are a couple of ways of doing our queries. In fact, there are, in Pandas, there are lots of ways of doing the same operation. Uh, that are less than a particular target uh, age, five in this case. Query is a very powerful operation. It's powerful, therefore it's a bit slower. It can do things like take in variables from the local namespace and do some very complex evaluations. Uh, it takes, in this case, um, nearly 500 milliseconds for an operation. If I generate a Boolean mask of the same query, so DFAG is less than five and use that as a mask to dereference the rows that I want, it takes about half the time. So that's really nice. Um, it, masking is the, the is the bread and butter way to look things up in pandas. But if you read lots of the guys, they talk about using a query because it's 
because it's powerful. It's great that it's powerful, but maybe it's a bit slower than you need. Uh, and then we're going to drop in here and then go back to the slides. Uh, final thing to think about, uh, many of our columns are represented in pandas by underlying NumPy data types, uh, like a float64 and the int64. Uh, we can do our operations on those underlying data types uh, by calling, say, the column ages.sum, and it takes a while to get our result back. But if I do ages.values to go down to the float64 that's behind this and ask for a sum, well, it happens about... 10 times quicker. That's kind of crazy. That's a huge speed up, right? 10 times speed up just by going down to the underlying NumPy column, um, uh, NumPy array uh, behind this pandas series by putting the dot values accessor in there. Uh, and I'm going to re return to the slides, talk about that a bit more because it turns out I'm almost doing the same job here and I'm slightly misrepresenting this as I learned uh, in the last week. So back to the uh, Back to the slides. First of all, thanks to James Powell. He was speaking this morning. Um, he gave me a bit of code uh, a couple of months ago because I was starting to ask the question, well, what's happening in pandas behind the scenes when I call an operation like series.sum? James wrote a bit of code recently, uh, which just tags every time you go into a function and you run a line of code and then it calls another function, which calls a line of code. Uh, it tags it all and then builds up a nice call graph. So I get an idea as to the fact that behind a series sum, there are 25 files being touched and 83 functions being accessed. That's quite a lot just for a summation. And if we look into that, and um, we zoom in just a little bit here, we see things like the index is being touched, um, the underlying ND array, uh, is it an extension type? Um, and a bunch of D-type querying going on. There's a bunch of work going on behind the scenes. And this is because Pandas is very powerful. It has to do a lot of checking. If you go to series.values to go to the underlying NumPy array and then call some 18 files and 50 functions. And if I page back, so that's the more complex um, going via Pandas to do it. And this is the uh, simpler way of doing it if we go directly via, um, directly via NumPy. Uh, so it's faster and simpler on code, and that's why it's a bit faster. But you do have to know what you're doing if you're going to go in that way. If it turns out you don't have a NumPy rate behind the scenes, you can't call dot values. That would make no sense. You have an optimization if you know that you can go behind the scenes. So this led me to ask the question just recently, like in the last week. Um, is it the case that uh, it's always faster to come out of pandas and go into uh, go into NumPy to do an operation. So I've been experimenting. I've had some other collaborators on this, which is lovely. And I've learned a lot out of this. So in this chart, we've got two bars, blue and orange. Blue is going to the Pandas series for an operation like mean. Uh, and orange is going to the Pandas series, getting dot values, and then from dot values, calling the operation like dot mean. Um, it turns out, so on the leftmost chart, in 64, that takes 800 megabytes for this uh, 10 million row random uh, vector inside pandas. Um, blue and orange, they're about the same size. That means the operation takes about the same time. In each of these uh, pairs of columns, the orange is at least slightly faster than the blue, slightly lower, 0.01 seconds, but mine are a tiny bit of jitter, but generally a little bit faster. If I take an int32 variant, so I've done as type int32 on the underlying data, it takes half the RAM, brilliant. But hey, look at that uh, speed chart. It actually gets a bit faster. So it gets faster in pandas, and it's faster if you go directly uh, to NumPy behind the scenes. We don't get any more speed ups if we go int16 and int8. We just use less RAM. But then it gets crazy if we go to float64. The pandas column, the blue column, that's nearly 0.06, whereas the orange column, series.values going to numpy, is 0.01, faster than the int equivalent. That's kind of crazy. And I thought, now this, this has got to be wrong. It's my machine. It's my hardware. It's something. So I had a few other people replicate this. And hey, indeed, it turns out uh, this general behavior persisted. Um, however, oh, yes, that's right. Uh, so however, uh, by filing the bug, and the bug is listed at the bottom there, it's uh, filed in the last week. You can find it in the pandas. Um, so uh, it turns out I was missing the bottleneck library. And so here's a tip for you. If you do the standard pandas install, you don't get the bottleneck library by default. Here I've installed it, and then I've used the pandas options compute use bottleneck to turn it off. I then call series.mean and I get 54 milliseconds. I turn bottleneck back on, series.mean, I get 16 milliseconds. That's a three times speed up for installing a library that I can get for free off the internet. That's brilliant, that's a great speed up. 
If I go series.values.mean, so via NumPy, it's five milliseconds. It's still three times faster again. What's going on? Well, as I learned, and if uh, you go and read this bug report, you'll see uh, the discussion with some of the pandas core maintainers, and thank you very much to them for educating me. It turns out the pandas mean is not the NumPy mean. Pandas mean is actually doing a NAN mean, so a NAN missing number respecting mean. Whereas, because I know that my data has no NANs in it, I didn't bother with the NAN mean in NumPy. I just called the mean function, uh, which is faster because it's not doing any NAN checks. So it turns out I wasn't quite comparing apples and oranges in this case. But if you know the, uh, what's in your data, you know that you've got no NANs, you can always go back to NumPy and make things run a bit faster. So here are some, uh, some uh, opportunities for you to get your code uh, to be highly performant. Um, I've mentioned the bottleneck library. There's also Numexpra. That's another library that makes queries and eval in pandas go faster. Both of these are referenced on the pandas documentation for enhancing performance. So if you search for pandas enhancing performance, you'll get this page. There's loads of good advice in there, including how to use number and Cython to compile your code. But some of the tips are, hey, there are these optional dependencies, which if you install them, make your code run faster for free. So I would strongly suggest you go and do that. Uh, I've mentioned that my D-type diet is up on my GitHub page. Uh, so I would dearly love your feedback on that. Please go and have a look at that. Uh, and if you're doing any operations that consume lots of RAM and you're wondering what's going on in the background, you might be interested in my IPython memory usage. That tracks between every call in an IPython or Jupyter session, how much RAM is used in the background, which might be released by the time you come back with the answer to get an idea of a RAM envelope running behind operations. That can help you slim down your code. Um, and I think this actually might be the more important slide here. Uh, I think, reflecting on 20 years in my career, uh, that the thing that makes me slow is not that my code runs slow, it's that I make mistakes. And that's it. I think the biggest thing is I make mistakes, I misthink, I mistype, but really I just get stuff wrong and then things go wrong. So. Pandas helps us out in various ways. There's an int64 that's available now with a big I, not the lowercase i. This is not in pandas, this is not in numpy, the big I version. The big I version is only in pandas. That gives you nullable integers rather than forcing you to use floats. There's an equivalent for Boolean and soon there'll be one for float64 with a big F. Uh, so it's all inside pandas, which gives the pandas devs an opportunity to give us more speed ups. Use that, your code will be saner. Write tests, unit tests, end-to-end -end tests. Uh, I live and die by the tests that I write. It means that I trust my code. If you're not checking your assumptions, and you saw in that notebook I used some assert statements, that's a really cheap, it's a bit of a nasty way of checking some assumptions, but it's better than having no assumption checking. Even better, use a library designed for this, like the Bulwark library, B-U-L-W-A-R-K. I super recommend you go and have a look at Bulwark, and then put some of those tests around your pandas data frame. And I've realized uh, I make notes for things that I'm learning in various different places. I've decided to codify some of these, for me, in a public, easily accessible place. So I've got a notes to self repo up on my uh, Ian Oswald GitHub repo. Uh, they're not notes for you, they're notes for me, but they're public, so hey, you might be able to get some value out of them. Every time I do something twice now that I know I've looked up in the past, a uh, bunch of matplotlib stuff and type checking stuff and panda stuff, I'm putting it in there so that it saves me time looking up and misremembering things. Maybe these things, uh, these ideas help you to become a bit more performant in your work. So in summary, uh, make it right, then make it fast. Uh, think about being more performant as a developer in your process. Think about actually where you lose your time. Uh, it's probably not in your query not running fast enough. It's probably in your general work practice. So have a think about that. Uh, a lot of this stuff I talk about in my classes. Uh, they'll be up on my blog soon. I've got one on um, higher performance Python, lots of compilation and profiling and the like. One on software engineering for data scientists where I focus more on unit testing and refactoring to make good code. Uh, and another one on successful data projects. So all of about the bigger picture of data science projects, how to make them work from beginning to end, from design through to delivery. Uh, and I think that's pretty much all I need to say right now. My final point is, if you've learned something here, I would love to hear about that. And I'd love to hear about it by way of a postcard. People send me postcards, they go onto my notice board, and they're a physical reminder. They're almost like customer feedback. They're a physical reminder that I've done something useful with my volunteer time. So if you'd like to send me a postcard, send me an email, I'll send you my address. I would love to receive a postcard from anywhere around in the world. Thank you very much.